Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Zero's 2021 Virtual Summit. I'm joined tonight by Dr. Elizabeth Heath from Carmano's Cancer Institute in Detroit, Michigan, and Dr. Charles Ryan from the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Dr. Heath and Dr. Ryan both also serve on Zero's Medical Advisory Board. So a big thank you to Dr. Heath and Dr. Ryan for taking the time out to, to chat with us tonight. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Beatrice and Merck, for helping us bring clinical trial, um, and especially around disparities, clinical trial information um, to us with the summit um, this evening. So tonight we're going to jump in, we're going to talk about 10 really important pieces of information that you need to know about clinical trials. Clinical trials, as we all know, are so important in all cancers, but really especially in prostate cancer. Um, we know that learning about trials can be confusing, it can be overwhelming, and so what we really hope to do is really just demystify those clinical trials, really help people understand what they truly need to know, questions to ask their doctor, um, and really truly what it's like to participate in a clinical trial and, and hope to put you at ease um, for you or your loved one um, as you consider a clinical trial. So with that, I'm going to zip it, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Heath and Dr. Ryan, um, again, thank you. And we will jump right into our top 10. All right, so our first one that we've identified that we wanted to chat about was simply about informed consent and really what that means, that participation is voluntary. We hear a lot at zero, you know, I'm not gonna participate in a clinical trial because I do not wanna be a guinea pig. So um, that's a very common myth as we know. Um, so if, if, if one or both of you would like to jump right into our number one, we can take it away. <laughs> well, I, I'll start with saying, I actually lead with that, Shelby. Um, uh, but before I go on, I want to thank everybody for uh, being on this really important discussion tonight and to Shelby and all the members at Zero, We're so incredibly uh, honored that uh, you, you take this cause forward and really do all that you can do to educate uh, each other. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, but as I said, I lead with that. Um, I put them at ease, my patients, to say, you are a guinea pig because we don't know the answer. Gosh, if Dr. Ryan and I knew the answer, it wouldn't be a trial. Um, so in some sense, they kind of feel like there's some honesty there, like, oh, okay, well, she's not even hiding that fact. So let's just talk about that. Um, and, you know, you never want to hear uh, from a, a patient, well, I don't really have a choice, do I, doctor? No, nope, you really have a choice. And that's the nice part about this discussion this evening. It's really to enhance your treatment menu, your options, um, and look at it as an opportunity, not something horrible. Um, you know, clinical trials come with such a history, um, some good, lots bad. Um, so we're here to dem demystify that. Um, but Dr. Ryan, do you have the same uh, kind of uh, conversations uh, in Minnesota with your patients? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the voluntary nature is the key point. Uh, and it's and, and I, I love these questions, by the way. And by the way, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you could join us. And I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of Zero again this year. Uh, one of my favorite activities to do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's voluntary uh, and proceeds only after potential risks of the trial and treatment are reviewed. Uh, and that is, that, that is one of the basis of, of informed consent. There are actually several uh, ethical foundations of sort of the modern uh, informed consent process, understanding of the risks, understanding of the potential benefits. And I think overarching all of that is that we only do clinical trials where there is therapeutic intent. We only do trials when there is a goal of helping the patient we are treating on the trial. And I think that's another piece uh, is that patients will say, well, Dr. Ryan, if you want me to be on this trial to help other people, I'm happy to do that. And, and I've had people say, I don't wanna do something for other people. I, I don't wanna be on this clinical trial only to help other people. I want something that will work for me. Well, the reality is every clinical trial that we design has to have this idea of therapeutic intent baked into it. Um, and so we wouldn't do something that offers no benefit to you uh, if, if uh, only to help others. And so that's kind of part of it, but it's risks, benefits, therapeutic intent. Informed consent is a process and it's a document. Um, and I think that that's a, another key part of it. Uh, I could talk for a long time about this, <laughs> uh, but I won't. <laughs> well, you know what happens a lot, um, Shelby, is that uh, that informed consent document it seems like it's somebody's PhD thesis. 
Um, you know, when I think uh, Dr. Ryan and I were in training, Chuck, I'm, I'm hoping you're older than me, um, but it was maybe five pages, six pages. We now have informed consent documents that are 20, 30 pages. It's not because we want to, but everybody has to have that disclaimer, like a commercial on television that tells you 20,000 things or people are twirling around. So we just happen to see that in a giant document. I want folks on the call on this webinar tonight to know, don't be scared. You see that it's just what we have to tell you, but we don't expect you to read it right then and there. In fact, I actually encourage all of my patients to take it home if they're not comfortable. Take it home, talk about it with your family, with your loved one, with your primary doctor, uh, with your spiritual advisor, whoever it is that is in your circle of folks that you talk difficult things with, take it home, take your time. There's no emergency that has to happen. And if it is, and it's not the right fit, it's perfectly fine to say, no, thank you. Right. So don't is. feel like, right, as doctors, we're like, oh, we have to say yes, absolutely not. It is a consent. It is not a contract. Uh, it is not a, an obligation to participate if you sign it. You know, we on the other side who are, who are conducting the research, uh, when we offer a clinical trial to a patient, we also understand that that means we, there, there's one less other patient we can enroll a clinical, onto the clinical trial. And so while it is not a contractual agreement, we do, we do hope that you, if you enter into the trial, uh, that you approach the, it with good faith on completing the tasks involved in the trial. Um, if those tasks are not, uh, if you're not up for it, if you don't have time, if, if it's too challenging, if it's too difficult and, 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 and all of that, then you don't have to be part of the trial. There's no, there's no uh, obligation. Uh, and, um, and that's what informed consent is really all about, kind of knowing what you're getting into. And the reason they get so long is we list potential side effects. And sometimes we're doing clinical trials in, let's say, prostate cancer with a drug that might be approved for treatment in, let's say, lung cancer. Well, we may have a whole wealth of information on the use of this drug in lung cancer, and we would put that in the prostate cancer document to some degree and say, well, we don't know what's going to happen in this prostate cancer study, but the lung cancer parent patients experience the following. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one other last point on the consent. I'm sure it's a diverse group of folks uh, on the webinar tonight. If English is not your first language, um, understand that you can actually ask the doctor for a translation. So many yes. places will actually have that in many other languages. Um, where I practice in Detroit, uh, we are an extremely diverse uh, community. So there are already short consent forms that can be turned around within a matter of days. Um, and that is a requirement from our institutional review board. So please make sure to ask just because you don't understand the English, doesn't matter, we can help Good. you. Great point. Yeah. Yeah, really, really great point. I think um, just on a technical side, I apologize for the interruption. Um, our viewers, I think are seeing too much slide and not enough speaker and I think um, we're going to make the focus on our speakers. So if, if you don't mind, Dr. Heath, Dr. Ryan, I'm going to just drive with the, with the points that we came up with. Um, and, and we're going to go from there. So I apologize to our listeners. We're going to make a little switch um, and talk through the next uh, nine out of our 10 points um, in this faction. So um, the next point that, our, that we came up with together was about placebos and mm -hmm. what a placebo is. Again, kind of that common myth, something that we hear a lot is I will never participate in a clinical trial. I'm going to get a sugar pill and I'm not interested in that and I need a treatment. So let's talk about placebos, when they're used, why they're used, um, how often are they used in oncology? Yeah, they're not used that often. Uh, I mean, the, the reason, the, the time when they are used is in a setting where everybody's getting the standard treatment or there is no standard treatment. You know, if, if, if the standard treatment is to not give treatment, that may be safer than giving a toxic treatment that doesn't work. And so, um, and so in, in situations like that, where you want to know, is it worth it giving anything in this setting? A placebo makes sense. If you have a drug that, that already is a proven drug, um, in, it's an already a standard of care, and you want to test whether adding a second drug, then what you do is you could add the placebo, the standard drug plus the placebo, or the uh, standard drug plus the test drug. And I think kind of going back to the informed consent, this will not be a secret. You might not know which arm you're on, but you'll know what the arms are. 
Yeah, we use a lot of words like you're blinded, uh, your doctor is blinded, your team is blinded. So it's not that we're blinded to you, we're just blinded to the assignment. So I've had a patient ask me, it's like, well, if everybody's blinded, who's driving? <laughs> I started laughing, but they're absolutely right. So we're really only blinded in terms of who's getting the real deal or not. But you guys who are enrolling know that we have to tell you if there's a possibility for a sugar pill or a sugar infusion. Um, but I want to make a point in terms of the Institutional Review Board. I'm sure many folks on this webinar don't know that regular everyday folks can sit on the Institutional Review Board. And in fact, we want advocates. And I'm sure there are many of you tonight that might actually fill that role. Yeah, they're um, required in many right? senses. They, they are really now required. Yeah. And what that means is as a lay person and you're reading this and if you're like immediately offended that something wasn't done right, I can assure you it's probably not done with any intention, but it might be an oversight, but it's your job as your IRB sort of mandate to say, hold up a second. If I was reading this as a regular person, non-scientist, I wouldn't know you're giving me this placebo. So we try to do everything up front to make sure that there are no surprises, um, but there's still some trials with placebo. So if you see that, what you wanna do is ask the doctor, what does this mean? Don't assume that somebody's trying to pull a fast one, but as Dr. Ryan and I know, there's good reason why there's suspicion, why there's worry. Um, you know, the, the history leading up to this with all sorts of not right experiments and so on, it's scary. And so it is up to you to ask this question and it's up to us on the other end to make sure we're explaining it right. And I'm sure Dr. Ryan just, you know, had that occasion like I do to have to sort of backtrack because sometimes you think we said it right um, and then you're like, maybe I didn't. So I often employ sort of uh, ask, tell, ask. And so I'm, I'm going to be so proud when I, I report back to our folks who do a lot of communication or behavioral oncology work, because sometimes we do a lot of talking. And then I, I learn to pause and have the person say it back to me in terms of what they think I just said. And the number of times where I go, Nope, that's not what I said and redo it again. I'm surprised. So you guys can also do that with your doctor to say, hang on a second. I just want to make sure I spit that back. And in the forms of clinical trials is probably the most helpful. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. uh, the IRBs having a public member or members, really, really important point. I should also go back uh, to something that you said, Elizabeth, which is uh, that it looks like a doctoral thesis or something like that. The reality is these, these informed consent documents can get long, but they are written at a sixth grade level. And, and so one of the review processes is, is the language simple enough? And, you know, I sat on an IRB for many years and that was part of what we, what the, what the analysts did, they would pick up a consent form and they would cross out all the doctor ease uh, and, and all of that type of stuff. Uh, and, um, and they're meant to be very dry, boring documents because they're not trying to promote, they're not trying to say, hey, this clinical trial is the next great thing because we don't know if it's the next great thing. That's why we're doing the trial. And so, you know, that's, they, they tend to be dry and just the facts and written at a, at a level that most people can, can understand. Yeah, they're not very flowery and fluffy and, and that's mostly good in science and in oncology. And I think if I'm not mistaken, really health literacy and patient centricity and that those focus, I mean, th those are really fairly new um, to the clinical trial and the science space, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The other well, thing that I, I worked, oh, I, I, when I was on the IRB, I worked, we worked hard on, on sort of uh, expressing is, why is this research being done? And, uh, uh, you know, that, that was always the first sort of prompt question of a, of a consent form. And, um, you know, I think that one of the challenges is sometimes we're doing research to see if we can, uh, you know, shrink tumors. Sometimes we're seeing it, if we can help people to live longer. Um, but, uh, but I think it's also an important point to talk with your doctor. What are the goals of this research? If it works out really well, what are you going, where are you expecting to see? Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we hardly ever say the goal of this clinical trial is to cure prostate cancer. Of course, we'd like that. Of course, we, we aim for that. Uh, but we also set different goals for our trials to, to move, to get forward progress towards that goal. Uh, so anyway, important part.
parts of what you can talk about with your doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and, and we started to allude to this, but our number, our number three point about what, what people should know about clinical trials are that clinical trials are approved only after that independent panel of experts that we already talked about, external community members and others have evaluated the risk and the benefits. So I, we've mentioned that I don't think we need to spend a great deal of time on it, but are there any other pieces of information that might be helpful for patients and their family members to, to know and feel comforted by? You know, one of the things that I think um, uh, it's important to know is being a good doctor and knowing your stuff is one skill set but being a clinical investigator is a different skill set. And so to ensure that we all know what the rules are, we actually have to be trained. Um, and so there is a specific training session called city training. And then there's other specific training session that's specific to that particular study. So as an investigator, we don't just say, oh, well, good, you know, I'm, I'm the doctor on this. It, it doesn't really matter. And that's important because sometimes the questions I get is, well, you, you have this trial here in Detroit. Can I go home in another part of the state of Michigan and have my doctor do it there? Because, you know, he's a doctor and you're a, a doctor. So it's a different level of training. Um, it's not that it's better. It's just a different thing that you do. So it isn't that your doctor doesn't know or whatever. It's just you need specialized training. But that also enforces the idea that we're paying attention because guess what, Shelby? The rules change. The rules change a lot, so, and it's so not also, to stay on top of it. Hugh, that's a very important point, and I would add to mm -hmm. that 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 once the doctor signs you up for a clinical trial, the doctor kind of um, I don't want to say loses control because but but we also have to follow the protocol, and so um, you know if if a if a doctor says oh you know I think I'll do this in addition to putting you on a clinical trial that might not work that might be a violation. And could get that doctor in trouble. Uh, now, if it's if if he or she says, "Oh, I have to do this to, to for your safety, or you know, for it's an emergency or something like that," and they violate the protocol, that's fine. Uh, we just ask for you know, we just spell out what we did and why we did it, and those things get approved. But I think the important thing is that the the it's one thing about signing up for and consenting for a trial. It's another thing understanding that once you join a study, the study sort of dictates you know. The, roughly the schedule, the dose, all this kind of stuff. And your doctor has to follow that protocol. So it's not, it's not a position to kind of get creative uh, at that time. Finally, um, a protocol that's approved by one of these committees has been approved by, a, you know, a doc, Dr. Heath says, I want to do this study. It's important to me. So her judgment applies. Her institution's judgment applies. This is the kind of science we want to be doing at Carmanos, right? Uh, and they might say to some studies, we don't want to do this trial here. It's not good for our patients. So they might reject it. Then the IRB, which answers to federal authorities, and there is a federal office of uh, oversight for clinical re oversight for research. It's called the Office of Human Research Protection. Federal government audits all these trials. And it's actually not the FDA necessarily. It's a different group uh, and um, uh, that looks at this. So um, so there's a lot of eyes watching clinical trials. There's a lot of audits. Uh, and, um, and so... Um, that's important. I think just important to know. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of people involved. So um, it's a whole team. Um, so if, if uh, Chuck or another doctor will say, hey, you know, I'm the doctor in charge, but then you have the research nurse, the coordinator, um, the regulatory people. So when you see a study, there's probably a, uh, many more people behind the scenes that are running that. Sometimes they're involved and you know them and sometimes you never see them, but everybody on the team is trained. And in fact, if we don't train them, you can't open the study. So I think it's important for folks tonight to know that there is a set of regulations that is not optional. It's not like, yeah, on this one, we're going to do this. And on that one, we're going to do that. There's none of that. There's a standard guideline. So whether you're in Minnesota, in New York, in Detroit, it's basically the same for all of us. So we, we have to follow the guidelines because they're there to keep you safe and to make sure what we're doing is ethical um, and legal and all the things that we all fuss about. But that's why all these regulations are in place. Right. Yeah. Such great points. And, and they're in place. Ultimately, I mean, the end game is to get more drugs into patients to, to help combat prostate cancer. So it, it feels really stringent and, and difficult and confusing, but um, that's it, what helps. 
I would just say it, it's not always just to get more drugs into patients. I mean, there are clinic, I'm helping design a clinical trial right now where what we're asking is maybe we can stop treatment in people who have been doing really, really well. Yeah, and we want to, we, we want to study that. Right. And so that's going to be a clinical trial where there's not going to be a placebo, but the control arm may be, Hey, you've done so great. We want to stop treatment and see what happens. Right. And, and evaluate the outcome. Uh, and there may be risk in doing that. And in fact, we have a study like that in kidney cancer now where so many people take kid, take immunotherapy for kidney cancer and do extremely well. And yet we continue to put these expensive, potentially toxic drugs into them. And so the question is, can we stop it? And so, um, you know, the outcome, the goal of the trial is uh, the goal of clinical research is to improve outcomes for patients uh, and their quality of life, the duration of life, uh, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. And that, and that brings up, I'm glad you corrected me on that because and that takes us to our number four, which is talking through the phases and what each of the phases of a clinical trial focuses on, some are safety, some are efficacy, um, and, and kind of similar to what you just mentioned, Dr. Ryan, is, is maybe we're looking at two uh, treatments that are already approved. Maybe, you know, maybe we're in that type of phase. So um, if you could, for our listeners, kind of dive into the different phases of clinical trials and, and how they differ from one another. Well, you're at a good phase one place, Elizabeth. So why don't you take phase one and I'll take phase two. That's great. You know, <laughs> phase one has a, a little bit of a double-edged sword. You know, many people who are on the, the webinar tonight might sort of feel like, oh boy, I think phase one is equivalent to the word experimental. Um, because when we have to develop drug and determine safety, which is really the number one question of any drug that's being developed, um, it feels a little scary, like, wow, I think she said I was a guinea pig and she's not kidding because I'm person number one ever in the world to get this medicine. But it can also be that, hey, you know, I've got two drugs that have been around. I just don't know if it's safe to put together. That's still a phase one. So your doctor needs to say, look, we're asking a question of safety, but the drugs that we're asking are either never been in a person or yeah, it's been around for, you know, two decades. And I just need to know that two of these together are okay. So it's absolutely a good idea to say, like what Chuck said, hey, what's the, what's the point of the study? You know, what are you really trying to do? Um, as, as you mentioned, Chuck, we are a center where we have a lot of early phase or phase one studies. And in a lot of ways, if you've had a lot of treatment, you're looking for those new drugs. And so we are excited to offer at least new strategies to try to kill the lousy cancer cells because we're as mad at them as you are uh, and we want your cancer cells to go away. Um, so to do that, uh, we do have a lot of options, which is really nice. Um, part of the struggle sometimes with phase one is from a patient level there, sometimes we ask more of you to do stuff. So in the well, in the trials that Chuck's going to talk about, maybe you show up once a month or once every three months. If you're in more of a phase one or early phase, you might be there every day for a week or every week for a month. So there's a whole bunch of schedules, not because we're worried about you. It's just we're checking to see what's going on with the blood, what's going on with the drug. So all of these things are really important to help us advance. But we can always say this, all the drugs that are approved now all went through phase one testing. Yep. So, you know, look at all the wonderful drugs that we have today compared to 20 years ago for prostate cancer. They all went through phase one testing. And yep. then after phase one, if we say, yay, it looks safe, then I'll turf it to phase two. So Chuck, that's something you can maybe take forward. Yeah. So phase two is um, once we've determined it's safe, or at least we've determined what is the safest dose that we can give uh, is we go into a, 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 a uniform population, more or less. Like, let's say we have a new treatment and we want to test it in prostate cancer patients who have already received abiraterone, right? So then we say, okay, well, we don't know what the effect of this drug is overall, but we're going to do a, a, a post abiraterone population. These generally are small studies that range from anywhere from 15 to 90 patients. Um, and, and they don't have a comparison arm in general, sometimes they do. Um, and, and so at the end of a phase two study, you could say in this post abiraterone patient population, our new drug resulted in 40% of the patients experiencing a significant decline in their PSA or 80% of the patients had a shrinkage of their tumor uh, on a scan or something like that. Um, and it really is designed to set up 
uh, or, or to ask the question, should this become the place where we test it against the standard of care? And that's the purpose of phase three. Absolutely. Pa passing it back to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, it's you know, let me three. tell you, since we're gonna get um, a little uh, deep on this, there is such a thing as a phase zero because I actually got asked that yeah. question about a month ago. They're like, so is there a zero and a minus one and a minus two? I was like, wow, that's really a smart question. There really is such a thing as a phase zero where you kind of maybe take a drug for a dose and then we're gonna take a sample somewhere, uh, liver or skin or something to see if it hits the target. It's not a very common thing, but it certainly does exist. You guys can also sometimes hear about a phase four. So, hey, you know, it's FDA approved and now we wanna know, uh, maybe we should figure out if we could take it only twice a week instead of once a week or yeah. uh, different ways. And so even after the FDA approves it, there's sometimes studies. So there are phase four trials as well, uh, but there's no five or six and there's definitely no minus one or two. So and by the way, not all it. phase one, not all phase two studies are done in with the intent of getting FDA approval. Um, you know, this is a debated topic, but if you do a well-designed phase two study and you show in interesting benefits and then you don't go on and do a phase three study, uh, can doctors use that to guide their judgment? And the reality is there are a lot of phase two studies that are published out there and they can be useful in helping to uh, pick a patient's dose, pick a, pick a scenario where we're gonna use the therapy. Um, we just can't do phase three studies with everything. Um, I've been part of a few phase three studies you know, the pharmaceutical industry that develops drugs uh, and, and pays for, for all of these trials, they may end up paying hundreds of millions of dollars to conduct a phase three trial. Like the drugs that we talk about in prostate cancer, the enzalutamides, the apalutamides, the apparatorones, et cetera, those studies were done in hundreds of centers, or I should say, yeah, hundreds of centers in dozens of countries. And, um, and they, uh, the, the data collection, the meticulousness of all of that costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. So at some point we you know, can look at a trial and we might say, well, this is really an interesting phase to result, but we have to prioritize. And we might say, this just doesn't rise to the priority of doing a phase three study. We still publish it and it may still be helpful. Uh, so, so that's one thing. And, and not all of them end up you know, going to the FDA. In fact, most don't. Yeah, you know, one of the things just to also be aware for early phase or phase one is you might be hanging out with other patients that are not prostate cancer patients, and that's okay. Sometimes we actually forget to tell you that because it's such a hot drug that there might be a breast cancer patient next to you or a lung cancer patient. So if you think about immune therapy on how many different disease types that it's actually approved in, those trials did have lung and kidney and breast and pancreas and all sorts of different cancers. So it doesn't mean that your doctor lost, you know, his or her ever love in mind going, why did she or he put me on a trial where that's a breast cancer patient. I'm a prostate cancer patient. So it's because we're all, we're really asking one question. And that one question is, is it safe? For a human being. So just be aware that those are sometimes the nuances. So um, for those who are just used to hanging around the, the guys with prostate cancer, uh, for these kinds of trials, it's a little different. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and, and I, you guys are doing such a great job transitioning to our next, to our next number, even though I moved the slides off. So um, great job. Um, but the number five of our 10 is, is just that the FDA has actually approved 24 treatments for prostate cancer. And, and Dr. Ryan, you, you kind of hinted to that and what's involved and what it takes to get an FDA approval. I mean, it's a huge undertaking, um, a huge investment and, and several failures that, that lead to all of these successes. Um, so I would love to hear your, your thoughts on, on our number five. So um, the FDA has a mandate written in, in, in their, their foundation, which is that they have to look at two um, factors in, in evaluating a drug or a treatment for cancer. They have to look at efficacy and safety. Um, and uh, they, uh, you know, their job is basically to say, it is, there's enough of a evidence of efficacy and the safety profile is acceptable enough for a company or whomever to market this to American citizens. FDA says nothing about cost. They say nothing about, um, you know, which should be the priority treatment in a particular area. They just talk about the efficacy and safety. And I think we're seeing that uh, with the COVID vaccines, right? Uh, FDA is clearly weighing in and saying, these are efficacious. 
uh, and the safety profile is, is acceptable. So it's a, it's a, you know, I think the COVID vaccine and the COVID uh, pandemic for all of its uh, terribleness is teaching the public a lot about science and how things are developed. And, and this is uh, one area. Um, but as I said, you know, the FDA uh, doesn't review everything. They, they actually review protocols. And so when I write a protocol or Elizabeth writes a protocol, and we're going to do a study at our own respective universities, we do send it to the FDA uh, and they have an option of, of, uh, of adding to it or amending it or denying it. But usually it's a, you send it to them, you hear nothing. And then 30 days later, you're fine. Like they, they, they usually don't have a problem with these once they've gone through the IRB and things like that. But that's not the same thing as getting an FDA approval. Um, I should also point out that uh, other treatments in cancer, whether they be surgical techniques, radiation therapies, they do not have the same level of approval. Uh, the FDA, or, who, or I guess it'd be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or other uh, federal authorities, approve radiation machines. They don't approve radiation treatments for particular diseases. Um, surgical instruments, the robot, all of that stuff, those are obviously under some regu uh, federal regulation, but nobody had to show that the robot was the best way to take a prostate out to get it approved to use. Um, and so drugs are very different, different sort of, you know, category, right? Yeah. And I would say also that, you know, the 24 is a wonderful number. We clearly, you know, it'd be great if there was a zero after that for everybody on the call, but just also recognize the bulk of that really came up after 2004. So if you look at sort of other cancers like breast cancer uh, and, and even lung cancer, uh, the treatment menu is really, it's just long. And for prostate cancer, it's been so little for so long that those of us who have been in the business a while, we're excited, you know, we're, and we have our hands with trials with so many more agents that what we want to do is if this is going to be a dud, we want to know with the fewest possible patients and we want to know it as soon as possible. Like it does not make Chuck or I feel good offering something that, you know, looks good on paper, looks good in the lab, but doesn't translate to the human being then we'd rather just know that and move on. Um, and I think having experts sort of figure that out is really to the benefit of the patients, but also it moves drug development along faster. You know, when a drug fails, it can be up to a billion dollars if we don't really say no to that early. Um, and it's a hard thing to do because you don't really want to kill it early, but at the same time, we don't have endless resources you know, to, to kind of use and to kind of uh, figure out for, you know, at so many other drugs. And, you know, many people on the, on the webinar here know tonight, there's so many coming down the pike in prostate cancer. It's going to be an issue of, oh gosh, what goes first? What goes second? All these things I'm sure are in different discussion points, you know, throughout this, this meeting, but it's, it's a, it's a tough topic. It's a tough topic. So here's a, here's a little bit of a wonky topic, but it's worth mentioning. Clinical trials, like the big phase three trials, they have early stopping rules and they have independent data monitoring committees. And those two, uh, those two um, stop gaps are in trials in case the trial is really, really great and successful or really, really uh, unsuccessful. And I, uh, I sit, and you may also, I sit on an uh, independent data monitoring committee for a phase three trial that's underway right now. And we're in a small group of people, we get to look at the data as it's going on. And we basically look and say, is there an imbalance between the arms? It looks like this might be unsafe. Are there excessive numbers of toxicities or deaths or something like that, that we would be concerned about? And usually there's not. And so you just say, well, we looked at the data and everything looks fine, just keep going. And we're, we're independent, independent. We're not employed by the companies. We're not employed by our universities to do this as an independent thing. Early stopping rules are rules in the protocol itself that says, if when, you know, if we're gonna do a thousand patients on a clinical trial, 500 patients in each arm, they might say, if after 300 patients have been enrolled, uh, there is a difference in survival of 15% or greater, uh, the study will be terminated. Uh, and, you know, I've been part of some clinical trials that were terminated early or at least unblinded early uh, because of positivity because they looked really good. Um, and in the abiraterone study that I was involved in years ago, that's what happened. The, the abiraterone arm was doing so well. They came out and said, we should let the people on the placebo know. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and so that's just an important point 
uh, that's part of the oversight of a trial, even after the trial gets through all these committees, it gets approved uh, at the institutions. So what happened with abiraterone, is that the same as compassionate use or are those two separate things? No, very different thing. Compassionate use is the use of a drug uh, outside of the context of a clinical trial where there may or may not be any data to support its use. It's kind of controversial, right? Elizabeth, do you yeah, want to it comment? Is. It's a tough thing and, and it's also really difficult to do. Um, you know, the paperwork involved in doing something like that, unless you, you already have an existing trial just for compassionate use, very difficult. Um, uh, it is a political issue too as well, um, where, uh, you know, it's really been batted around in terms of whether it should be a, a law and what is the bare minimum. So I think those discussions are still ongoing. Um, but, you know, part of the issue also about these 24 drugs that you mentioned, Shelby, and it's a little bit of a shout out and an encouragement for those who are on now to stay on for the next webinar, um, is that it's not, um, these drugs have not really been studied in the diverse population of the United States of America or even global of the world. Um, you know, this is a tough topic to, to sort of reconcile because, a lot of the data that comes out in terms of, hey, there was a survival benefit, we're kind of extrapolating that, yep, that's gonna work in all populations. And yes, it's all men, true. Some, some disease groups don't have that um, as a already as a starting point, um, but uh, there's usually not enough enrollment of any uh, you know, underrepresented groups, not just African-Americans, but Hispanics, uh, Middle Eastern, Asians. Um, it's a really tough topic that needs and continues and demands to be overhauled. Um, a lot of it is sometimes cultural perceptions of whether trials are good uh, or helpful or something they should invest in or whether trials are more taboo and I'm getting the short end of the stick because my doctor's gonna put me on a trial. Um, so I think we have to work really hard to make sure that as the next 10 years rolls around, that as we get more drugs, it's really going to be effective in a larger representative group. So that to me is just still a really, really big topic that we have not solved, but are starting to. And I'm, I'm happy to see that. Absolutely. So well, I, I, I was just make one, one other quick point. Yeah. There's, clim there's FDA approved use of a drug. You're using a drug that the FDA approved on the label in the indication where the, where the FDA said you should use it, could use it. There's compassionate use, which we just discussed. Then there's off-label use. And, and that, is, uh, that is something where we might think, we might, based on a phase two study, for example, uh, think that this particular drug may work in this particular patient. And so we may order it. Insurance companies may say, well, it's not FDA approved. And I might write a letter and say, well, but there's five phase two trials showing efficacy of this agent. And, uh, and I want to use it off label. And many times the insurance companies will pay for it, not always. Uh, that's something that happens behind the scenes a lot with doctors that I think patients may not appreciate uh, that we're, we, have to, we have to get permission for some of these things. Um, but I, there, there are occasions when I use um, certain drugs off label in the setting of prostate cancer. The one most notably is a drug called carboplatin that we use as a form of chemotherapy. I also have a clinical trial testing carboplatin. Uh, in, in different settings. So, and the reason I use carboplatin on off-label setting is that there are many, many clinical trials showing that it works in prostate cancer uh, in particular situations. Yet it is not FDA approved. It's a generic drug. So unfortunately, it's gonna be hard to find the $200 million to run a phase three study to get that approved. We might be able to do that through our National Cancer Institute programs, but anyway, that's a difference uh, between compassionate use and off-label use. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that. Um, let's jump in uh, to our number six and a little bit into our number seven. Um, and that's a, a bit to Dr. Heath's point earlier in um, the health equity piece. And what we know is that African Americans make up about 13% of the United States population, but, but unfortunately, only about 5% of clinical trial participants. And so we we talked about um, the, the need for patient centricity and the patient voice on clinical trial design. Um, and then just really that participants in trials really need to reflect the patient population um, with particular attention to those at most um, high risk. So if we could chat about that, that would be great. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough situation because I think there's so many factors that impact why, uh, as a group, African Americans are underrepresented. Um, but, you know, you learn a lot. It doesn't even have to be cancer trials, but you look at, let's say, COVID vaccines and uptakes. Um, you know, it's, it's not been a resounding success in the African American uh, group in terms of wanting to take the COVID vaccine. Every person I see, and my practice is uh, 50 to 60 percent African Americans uh, with prostate cancer, um, and I say, "Hey, do you have a COVID vaccine plan?" Um, and the number of times it's the, "Yeah, I got a plan. I'm not taking it. <laughs> That's my plan." Um, and you ask, and there's just a lot of misinformation um, uh, that keeps getting passed from one person to the other, from communities. Um, so I think from an education standpoint, that's what's going on. Now, from a trial standpoint, we've done better. So in our own studies in Detroit, we know that if you make the offer, so as the provider makes the offer to uh, the patient, the answer usually is sure. Part of the issue that happens is the offer is never made. And I tell you, I catch myself sometimes in these biases, even as a person who knows that I've got these biases, that I have to make a really hard effort to make sure to say, well, just because this person's older and maybe I'm a little worried about transportation and maybe I'm a little worried that his wife is a little bit more compromised, that I don't bring it up. And I realize, ah, of course I have to bring it up. And I do, and the answer is like, okay, well, I'll have my granddaughter bring me, no problem. Um, and so even those moments where I feel like, gosh, I, I, I even know to do this, I have to make it an intentional step. So I think part of it is realizing in your own practice, what are some of the barriers other than the traditional, here are my hundred reasons why it doesn't work and just pick a few and try to overcome. I don't know, Chuck, what about you? Uh, well, a complicated question. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there are, uh, there's a principle of justice and fairness. And one of the things you learn if you study medical ethics is how we got to this point around informed consent, uh, you know, why we have IRBs. And all of this is kind of relatively recent history. It all came out of World War II and the Nazis and, and Nuremberg Report. And there was a thing called the uh, the, the, Helsinki, the Convention of Helsinki in the 1960s, and then a thing in the United States called the Belmont Report in the 1970s, and they established principles of medical ethics for doing research. And one of the principles that people kind of forget about is this, you know, uh, is, is uh, justice and fairness. And, and, and fairness means you should offer a clinical, they don't say it specifically like this, but everybody who is, in, who is eligible to receive the research should be offered it. And so, you know, it's, it's our obligation. And I've, I've done this sometimes where you offer a patient a clinical trial, you clearly know they don't want to be part of it or whatever, but, um, but you offer it because that's the right thing to do. That's justice and fairness. And um, so, you know, um, uh, I, I, I put that out there and that is one of the challenges. One of the challenges of clinical trial participation is frequently comorbid illness. And, and, and you know, it might be that the disease is in a certain situation but honestly, we just don't know if we can give this drug to people who have abnormal kidneys or something like that. That's a question of eligibility. That's not fairness, right? Uh, so, you know, that's one concept. Uh, social factors, um, certainly race, obviously is something that we would, we would not have as a, as a factor to, to not enroll a patient, but social factors can also interplay, such as, is this patient going to be able to get to our clinic every week to get this treatment? And it might be that, you know, you can't get a ride or, or something. And, and that is something where we may mutually decide that a clinical trial is not for that particular patient, but we should still talk to them about it because, you know, sometimes things work out well and we, we surprise. So we, we shouldn't be making, we, the doctors should be making assumptions because we can get trouble doing that. Yeah. And Shelby, I think we know even the drugs that have passed trials um, if you give them for one race over the other, it's as effective, period. So it's not the, oh, when we finish the trial and there's an answer and there's an inequality in the treatment. Nope. In fact, we know that sometimes the, the, the uh, drugs are actually better in one race group over the other. So 
You won't know that if you don't have the right representation. Um, but that's why in a lot of ways, the work is more than just race and ethnicity. Yeah. It's also geographical barriers. So we know urban versus rural. Um, folks who are in rural communities don't have access. Um, they wouldn't know where to go. And also, um, you know, figure out that their uh, providers in that community are tethered into other centers that would have this option. So part of the beautiful thing I think about Zero is you guys are sort of an all-inclusive service where if you just say, just start there, just start there, and you start hitting those buttons, you go, oh, wow, maybe it's not right here in my backyard. But you have to say, my conversation with that started with, you can go on the web and so on and so on. So, you know, if you're in a rural community, sometimes the Wi-Fi is not great. You don't really have access to that. Uh, there isn't an, a nearby library or education center. The hospital is three hours away. So these are factors that, again, impact that. Um, but the geography issue, I think, in the U.S. is a huge one. The Just most, race and the, ethnicity. The biggest risk factor for a patient not going on a clinical trial is that the doctor doesn't have the clinical trial available for the patient. And, you know, clinical trials are not something that are restricted to universities, nor should they be. Uh, and, you know, and this is a big part of what I do at my center here in Minneapolis, where we have a number of satellite clinics. Actually, we have a, we have a statewide network in Minnesota that is specifically geared to bring clinical trials to rural or what we call greater Minnesota. And, um, and so, uh, you know, that's critically important because we, those of us who do that, like I, I do this every day, this is my life's work is clinical trials of prostate cancer, but it's not the life's work of the person who's in, you know, Thief River Falls, Minnesota, because he's a community oncologist or she's immune and they have to take care of everything ranging from early stage breast cancer to lung cancer to lymphoma. And they could benefit from a partnership with me where we could offer them a good clinical trial and make it easy for them really is the kind of the idea so that that prostate cancer patient who walks into that clinic can be offered the same clinical trial or at least some of the same clinical trials that I might be doing in, at the university. Well, and I'm gonna propose that one of the positive things from the pandemic, because we gotta focus on something positive, is that the use of telehealth has definitely increased. So, you know, before that there was this reluctance, like, well, I'm not gonna talk to that person. You know, I don't know who that person is. Is my person eligible? I don't know. Here, you can just ask if you would do a quick telehealth consult and you can learn a lot by just like right now, we're having a discussion. Um, and if the answer is, mm -hmm. Dr. Heath, what are you crazy? I'm not driving 12 hours in the Upper Peninsula to see you weekly. Or, yeah, okay, I drive all the time from the Upper Peninsula. Go Ubers, and I'll see you all the time. So it's no big deal. Upper um, Peninsula is actually closer to Minnesota than it is. Yeah, to, I might uh, well just have them go Detroit. to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to see a patient of the Upper Peninsula, but it's there. Uh, I mean, it's actually not super close, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a really important point, and and we are. Uh, we, we are going to be expanding our ability to do new patient consults. Um, I'm, doing, I'm giving a talk next week in a different setting on uh, the, the changes in, in uh, licensing, medical licensing uh, that COVID is bringing about uh, and, and how that may, it's not specifically about clinical trials, but uh, there are 36 states, I think right now that have a, they've just formed a compact where you can get a license in all 36 states. You have to pay a fee, but wow. you can do it. And so, you know, that means that I, uh, I could, I can have a license in Wisconsin, for example, I could see a patient who's come from, who's from Wisconsin and they might want to do a telehealth visit with me and see, could I be on his clinical trial before they drive up Minneapolis and park and all that. Um, and, uh, I moved from California to Minnesota and I, uh, still have a California medical license. So I see patients from California and, and you know, so I think that's a, a big thing that's going to change with COVID is now we can do video visits across we could, we could always do visits across state lines but somebody had to cross the state line yeah and now we can now we can do video visits uh, and people don't have to cross the state line i think that's only going to help uh the clinical trial world well and i have to say then the question is well how am i going to reach out to have these people so in the state there will be a national cancer institute designated cancer center so if you just reach out and ask your doctor hey is there a nearby NCI designated cancer center? They will probably be your hub. 
uh, chances are your doctors are already collaborating or know the people that work there. Um, and that's always a question you can ask your doc if you're not being seen at one of these centers to say, well, what do they have? It doesn't hurt to ask. And, and you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, <clears throat> type in prostate cancer, you know, Missouri, and it'll bring you what's going on in Missouri with regards to prostate cancer. It's clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah, great point. And I mean, so to, to your point about clinicaltrials.gov, you know, it's not it's not a system that a lot of patients really love. Sometimes it can be difficult to navigate, but don't be afraid to continue playing around in there and using different filters and factors and and um, criteria because it will you know you'll you'll become more comfortable with the platform and with the system and then and be a little bit more informed and empowered when you're speaking with your doctor about it. Um, so we have, uh, we'll just hit one more of our points and then uh, a couple of questions are rolling in, but um, I'm going to jump to our number 10 because we've hit on, on a couple of trust issues between doctors and researchers and patients already. That was our number eight and our number nine kind of was, uh, I talked about in the beginning portion of our, of our conversation and that's really just that patients can stop participating in a clinical trial whenever they want and we already kind of touched on that. So um, let's jump to number 10, and then we'll take a couple of questions before we have to wrap up for the night. And that one is that clinical trials can be considered as first-line treatment options. We, I'm sure you hear a lot in your practice that, well, I, I really can only consider a clinical trial if I failed on another treatment, so I'm not going to think about it yet. Um, so talk a little bit about a trial being used as a first-line treatment option. Yeah, uh, so I have a clinical trial right now for new patients with newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. And we're looking at a combination chemotherapy approach. These are patients who are, have never yet received any treatment. And, uh, you know, the philosophy behind that study is uh, the best, uh, improving first treatment is going to be the best way for us to move forward in, in curing this disease. Uh, and if we only did clinical trials after everything else failed, we wouldn't get much progress and it would be a lot of, there'd be a lot of disappointment. And, you know, to Elizabeth's earlier point, everything we do in oncology, we do because a trial showed that we should do it in that space for the most part. <laughs> yeah. And I think many, many uh, centers now have first line trials uh, or even earlier, you know, lots. And, and those on the webinar know prostate cancer is a very sort of systematic journey that we keep harping on. Um, those trials are getting earlier, earlier in development. So uh, the best advice is just ask your doctor, again, what's the purpose of this? How do you think this will uh, be played out in my treatment journey? And, you know, ask those questions. Yeah, great point. So well, thanks, thanks to you both for jumping through those, those 10 um, with us. Um, for the next uh, seven or so minutes, we'll take a couple of questions from our listeners. Um, and one, I'll just give a quick shout out to the person who wrote the question and that her, this person's son was a clinical trial participant. So um, thank you for, for participating in, um, in science. But it was when uh, the drug Provenge was in a clinical trial. And um, this person is simply asking um, about how far we've come since then. And do they even use that drug anymore? Go ahead, Chuck. And we do use it. Uh, you know, Provenge is an interesting situation because um, it, uh, it was done in a phase three placebo controlled trial where uh, it did lead to an improvement in survival. Uh, reduction in the risk of death by about 23%, I think, over time. Uh, and actually, in retrospect, that trial was a very uh, advanced group of patients with a, with a wide spectrum of uh, disease states. Um, we have, because of the nature of Provenge, because, some, because of the sort of evolution of the company, there have been relatively few big studies, but we have learned a lot about Provenge. So for example, it was a really big uh, registry of everybody getting Provenge in the country. And or more or less, and then were followed. And there was a really nice analysis that showed that African-Americans do very, very well with Provenge, actually better than non-African-Americans in terms of their outcome. That's, it's not clear why that is, but it's thought to be something related to differences in, in immune function. The other thing about Provenge that I think is kind of interesting is that it, it is a cell therapy. We take cells out of the body, we alter them and we put them back in the body and it improves survival. Now we're in a new, a new age of cellular therapies, uh, very, very different cellular therapy approaches, but now they're being used in leukemia and others. And we're actually gonna be testing 
these things called CAR T cells in prostate cancer. So it's a little bit ironic, isn't it? That it's a, it's a cell therapy now that's been around for about 15 years. Uh, yeah, it's hard to be first. It's hard to be yeah, first yeah. anything. Uh, but if you look back, they actually were sort of the pioneers in sort of opening this up. So like anytime you're first, there's a lot of, you know, pros and cons. And, you know, I think the, the thing for uh, the person who asked that question is a big giant thank you for participating. We won't know the answer if people, you know, didn't participate. Just of note, there was this very cool article that just came out that showed, uh, oh, this is how Provenge works. It really you know, helps to impact the immune system. And they showed some, some pictures that were very, very cool and that just got published. So we are getting better at understanding, gosh, how does this drug actually work? Yeah, yeah. But we're thrilled. We're, we're thrilled that it's- Yeah, the, one of the challenges with Provenge before we leave this point is that it, it is not a remission inducing therapy. It right. slows the pace of the disease. And if you can slow the pace of a chronic disease, you can help people live longer. But it's very different from like the new cell therapies where the idea is, the, the disease is moving so fast, you have to reverse it. You have to shrink the tumors. And Provenge doesn't do that. And, and so that's a challenge where some people say, you know, I got Provenge, it didn't really seem to do much. You can't really tell because, you, you, you know, I, I kind of quip and joke with my patients. I give Provenge and then I declare victory and then we do the next thing, you know? And, and it's because we just kind of sort of hope that they're the ones where the disease is, is slowing down. Uh, we did get another question, and, and Dr. Ryan, you were beginning to hit on this in that the, some of the, the, the drugs, the treatments are um, governed by the, by the FDA, and, um, and, but some of the machines really aren't. But what about um, the, like the contrast mediums that are being looked at now? How are those governed? Uh, yeah, so I think maybe the question is about, for example, PSMA PET scans and things like that, which uh, it's a really good question because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, odd regulatory space. They're not drugs. Uh, they, aren't, uh, they aren't evaluated on efficacy and uh, safety to the same degree that drugs are. But the PSMA PET scans were just approved uh, based on their ability to guide clinical judgment. Um, and, uh, and that was something that happened. So um, I think that I don't know this, but I think that most of the contrast agents and things like that that we inject into people to take pictures is regulated by either the nuclear regulatory, like people who regulate the nuclear the nuclear safety, uh, and to some degree the FDA. I mean, the FDA did approve the PSMA PET scans. Just not a, they didn't have to show that it led to improvements in survival. They just had to let let it show that it changed the judgment or it changed the the course of treatment that the doctor was delivering. Um, and so I'll, I'll just to hit on this one last, it's sort of a, a comment, not so much a question, but I'm, but I'm sure um, the two of you can chime in. And this is from one of our listeners that really just said certain phase one studies disclose that they are the first in human trials. And just reading that is concerning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know, I always say to my, my patient, you're either going to be like, Hey, you're the, you're the first guy like ever. And if your answer isn't like, Woo then it's like, okay, we're moving on. Um, so the nice part is it's a really, uh, you know, diverse group of different studies. So if that does not appeal to you, then we are moving on. There are some of my patients who actually look for that because they want to be the first. They want to say, that's, that was me. I'm that guy. So different mindset. Um, but just, just remember all those safety features and everything else we talked about. That's I would okay. say uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good point. And, and I think uh, your point, Elizabeth, is excellent. Like it's not for everybody on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, we don't just pick random stuff off of shelves and start administering to people. It's like, by the time we do a first human study, there's, you know, sometimes decades of research that have gone into the development of this molecule. People who have spent their lives in labs working on model systems for prostate cancer or breast cancer, and they found some receptor and they spent you know, years uh, finding this little protein in the cancer. And they said, hey, if we block this protein in this cancer, the cancer goes away. And they do that in cells in a dish. And then, then somebody does it in mice or whatever. And so you know, by the time it gets to actually going into a human being, there's been a huge amount of work uh, about this. And the sad part is you know, some of the things that these people spend their entire lives developing, uh, you put them into humans, they don't work at all. 
Um, and that's why we have to do the clinical trials, which is kind of brings us full circle. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. We have one minute remaining. So I'm going to talk really fast. We have a very exciting um, conversation, another conversational type presentation for you live. Our racial disparities task force is coming up. They're going to have a panel discussion on a few different topics. Um, so Dr. Heath, Dr. Ryan, thank you so much for your time, for your energy, for your insight um, on clinical trials. We're so appreciative of you. And thank yeah, my you pleasure. Thank you for having me. Next year, we'll see you, right? Can't yes, see you this year. Absolutely. Absolutely. See you in Take person. Bye-bye.